Good evening. I'm Joanne Roberts, Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the college. And I have the great pleasure of welcoming all of you to this evening's or this morning's discussion on reimagining health, public health, global leadership perspectives for a post COVID world. We are so fortunate Yale and US to be able to bring together thought leaders and colleagues from our founding institutions in conversation with our faculty. Tonight, we're honored to have the deans of the schools of public health at Yale and at NUS, as well as our own dean of faculty. Their conversation could not be more timely or important, and I'm thrilled to see such a large and diverse audience. In addition to everyone on campus, I want to recognize parents, alumni, prospective students, the wider public in Singapore, and the many Yale alumni across Asia who are with us here tonight. If you're not already on our mailing list, I encourage you to join. So we have an incredible lineup of speakers this semester, and I hope you will join us for more events like the one tonight. Before I begin, I have two administrative announcements. First, we request that you do not take screenshots or recordings of tonight's session. It will be available on the college's Facebook and YouTube pages. Second, we very much welcome audience questions. For those of you in the Zoom room, please enter any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you watching on Facebook, please use the comments section. Our speakers will try to answer as many of your questions as they can. Let me now turn this over to my colleague, Jeanette Ikeveks. Dr. Ikeveks is the Dean of Faculty at Yale and US College and a professor of social sciences here. She's also the Samuel Lislot Herman Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Yale School of Public Health and Professor of Psychology at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Yale University. She's the founding chair of the Social and Behavioral Sciences at Yale School of Public Health and founding director of Community Alliance for Research and Engagement. Jeanette, you have the floor. Thank you, Joanne, and good evening or good morning to all. One year ago, the World Health Organization declared a global health emergency due to the spread of the novel coronavirus we now call COVID-19. Today, nearly 105 million infections have been documented worldwide, along with more than 2.2 million deaths. Let's pause for a moment to reflect that these numbers are indicative of profoundly personal losses due to the deaths of beloved parents and grandparents, husbands and wives, siblings and children, friends and colleagues. As we struggle to contain the virus and its variants, and as we strive toward broad vaccine delivery, we too must recognize that we are in the midst of a pandemic of collective loss, grief, depression, and anxiety. COVID has transformed all of our lives, and it defines this generation much as the Great War or the Great Depression defined earlier generations. That said, it is important also to recognize our inherent resilience. Although irrevocably changed, I remain cautiously optimistic about our collective future. We've learned a tremendous amount this year that grounds a deeper understanding of risk and resilience in broad social, political, and economic contexts. And this foundation of knowledge and experience will influence the future of public health. I am pleased to welcome Dean Yik Ying Tio from the Sasri Hawk School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore along with Dean Sten Vermund from the Yale School of Public Health. In 2018, the three of us gathered in the Yale NUS Performance Hall to discuss the future of public health. And it's wonderful to be able to reprise our conversation today, albeit in quite a different moment in time. Uh, as you saw by the slides scrolling, uh, and as Joanne mentioned, this is part of a larger series of talks, bringing together faculty from Yale NUS, Yale, and NUS. Today, we will engage in a most timely dialogue, uh, reimagining public health, global, global leadership perspectives for a post-COVID world. Each of us will speak for about five minutes, and then we will open for discussion and questions from you, our global audience. Dean Tio, let's begin with you to share some of your perspectives on Singapore's relative success in containing this epidemic. Thank you very much, Jeanette, and also Joanne, especially for the invitation to get together with Stan again to have another round of East meets West. Uh, 
this time around, we are gathered to talk about a more sombering topic as Jeanette, you have introduced, COVID-19. And really, if we look at the current situation, we've passed 100 million uh, about a couple of weeks ago. The response in Asia Pacific has been rather amazingly different from what we are seeing in many parts of Europe and many parts of North America. And this traditionally have been the places that we look to for guidance, for leadership in the area of global health security. So I think it's useful to perhaps just reflect together with Stan on some of the key factors that we think would have been responsible, whether it is for a better performance or worse performance in different parts of the world. And it's very easy for people to say that Asia Pacific, bulk of Asia has done well uh, because it's cultural, that people tend to be a lot more community spirited in this part of the world. But I always highlight that Australia and New Zealand stands out very clearly that even with a, a westernized or European culture, Australia and New Zealand have similarly done extremely well in managing the outbreak. And I think if we start to distill some of the very common factors that we have seen, and, and many academics, public health experts, political science experts have really spent a lot of time looking at jurisdictions that have done well in managing the COVID crisis. It really boils down to a few key elements. Firstly, around communications and leadership. Secondly, around the political will to implement and enforce difficult measures. And third is whether the scientists are working together with the policy makers to guide the, the development of policy responses that are based on evidence because that directly impacts a lot of decisions made around border control, around whether schools or public facilities should be closed, or even mask wearing. And face mask wearing in Singapore was controversial at one point, uh, because, and it co continues to be the common gripe of people that likes to say that the government, the Singapore government, or even Singapore public health experts themselves aren't consistent. A couple of months before that, they were advocating, no, you don't really need a mask, a couple of months later, they are in the media highlighting that there's a need to wear masks. And that's the reality with a new emerging public health crisis. The evidence does change. And the policies that public, the, the policies that need to be put in place needs to be guided by evidence and science. And even if they do change, there is going to be a flip-flop in policies. So be it, because that's where new understanding comes about and policies have to change. So I talk about the bit on communications and leadership. This is why it is extremely important in a crisis that communications are very frank, very transparent, and also guided by evidence. So even when there is a need to change policies, you are guided by the evidence that previously a month ago, we didn't know better. We didn't know in February, asymptomatic in infection can happen. We didn't know that in February, what are the likely, the high risk settings that we know right now. So those are some of the evidence that have guided countries that have done well. And I always like to talk about the ability or inability for a jurisdiction to respond during a crisis, especially a public health crisis really is a function of decisions taking, taken in the past. And when I talk about the past, Singapore, we had a very difficult, horrifying past that we learned from, that SARS back in 2003. That led us to, to prepare our hospitals, that led us to stockpile essential medical goods and, and even uh, daily goods, including rice. They, put, they allow us to put in place public health preparations, including at the polyclinics, at GPs, around contact tracing protocols. And most importantly, it guided us on the investment in science and technology. And that is why Singapore, I'm very proud to say that we are able to punch above our weight in terms of our biomedical sciences, the development of technology, looking at how we contribute to vaccine development, 
mathematical modeling and how the mathematical models are guiding some of the responses, not just in Singapore, but also in other countries in Asia Pacific, the development of rapid test kits. Now, while I've, I mentioned some of the, the highlights of where Singapore has done well, and certainly there have been many echoes that Singapore have done well in managing COVID-19. I always like to ground ourselves again by highlighting that it is easier to govern a country like Singapore, which is a small island country where we have a finite number of border entry points. You are able to guard your entry points much better than many other larger countries with porous land borders. Culturally, our people tend to be more community spirited that I mentioned. And also, Singapore, we have had our fair share of mistakes that we've committed. And I talk about the leadership and the communications. This is where our prime minister, our ministers who are guiding the responses have been very upfront to say that they have made mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes that we had was around the way that we managed the migrant workers. And we had to pay a very significant price to manage this situation subsequently. So it is not all rosy in, in Singapore, but one thing that is clear is that identify where are the weaknesses, which are the segments, the population segments that are vulnerable and neglected, find ways to manage those problems. And I think that that is what we need to move forward to in the second part of the outbreak. Right now, we're looking at vaccines. I'm sure we will talk about vaccines later on. But at this point in time, I will stop uh, here and then introduce my counterpart from the Yale School of Public Health, Dean Stan Vermont, to also uh, share his talking points. Stan, over to you, please. Thank you so much, YY. We really uh, value these opportunities to uh, share our thoughts uh, with the audience that's today. It's really a great pleasure and privilege for me. Um, I'd like to make three simple points. First of all, national and uh, public health leadership matters. It matters a lot. Sometimes I bump into someone who's a little cynical here in my country and they say, well, it doesn't matter if, if uh, one party is in charge or another party is in charge, but um, think about the response of the prime ministers of South Korea, of Norway, of New Zealand, versus the uh, presidents and prime ministers of the US, the UK, or Brazil. Uh, the contrast couldn't be more stark uh, as to how uh, leaders have responded to this crisis. Uh, we have the metaphor of the ostrich uh, sticking its head in the sand. My biology friends tell me that ostriches don't stick their heads in the sand, but that's the metaphor of ignoring a problem when it's facing you. And um, there were national leaders who embraced the problem and responded, uh, as YY said, in a, in a um, evidence-based fashion. Um, and then others who had bizarre sort of denialist viewpoints, um, almost a macho approach, where if they were going to react to this, they would show weakness. And of course, uh, this is uh, almost the definition of insanity. A second point uh, is that planning matters. Not only leader leadership, but also planning. In 2017, the US uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one of the premier public health agencies in the entire world, um, updated all of its pandemic influenza prevention plans. And when you read these, they're almost like a blueprint for what we should do to prevent uh, the novel COVID, uh, 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 the novel coronavirus uh, spread in the United States and around the world. They had details about um, personal protective equipment, PPE planning. Um, they, there were contracts that were let for mass production of masks and ventilators. And uh, mass production was optimized so that millions could be produced in a week. Um, and ventilator capacity was optimized so that low cost, high efficiency ventilators could be managed. 
but we never took the next step. We just developed the techniques, but we never actually uh, planned on deploying it. So we had planning that went so far and didn't continue further. Another good example of planning is the SARS vaccine. So we began working on SARS vaccine in 2003, 2004, but when the, when the, when the pandemic subsided because of global response and because it wasn't very infectious person to person compared to other viruses, then we um, uh, halted uh, SARS vaccine uh, development. Imagine if we had developed a safe and, uh, and immunogenic vaccine for the SARS coronavirus, how much more quickly we could have developed the SARS-2 uh, vaccine. And then the third point, along with leadership mattering and planning mattering, is capacity matters. Um, public health partnerships um, with industry, for example, are absolutely essential. Uh, the governments don't have capacity to develop millions and millions of test kits or uh, hundreds of millions of vaccines or um, um, uh, millions of, of therapeutic agents. Industry has that capacity. So we have to be prepared with uh, prior planning, prior leadership to have public health partnerships with industry for these vital tools. Then the public health response itself has to be robust, has to be compelling. Um, take, for example, contact tracing. Uh, in the US, we've permitted our public health infrastructures to deteriorate. Um, what used to be robust contact tracing systems for tuberculosis, for uh, sexually transmitted infections, um, ha have been uh, cut as a consequence of budgetary concerns. So we did not have the experienced contact tracers in place, ready to ro roll into action uh, at the time that we needed them for, um, for the um, novel coronavirus. Uh, public education is not, uh, is not well honed, uh, is not smoothly deployed. And some of our global partnerships have been a huge disappointment. Just take a look at uh, how the European community is now struggling uh, to meet the needs of its 450 million people uh, in securing vaccines. So those are just some thoughts. Um, we've gone, uh, it's gone badly in my country, putting it bluntly. Um, and I envy uh, YY's uh, commentary about Singapore having um, uh, deployed evidence-based uh, interventions, learning from its mistakes, admitting its mistakes, uh, pivoting their, um, their work uh, to a highly successful response, um, that, uh, that you had difficulty with your immigrant workers. We've had difficulty with our entire population and we have the worst uh, uh, pandemic circumstances anywhere in the world with about a quarter of all the global cases so the reality is that the United States, as powerful and wealthy as it is, because of failure of leadership, failure of planning, and failure of capacity building, has done poorly. Uh, happily, we're in the vaccine era, and we hope we can turn the corner on this pandemic. I'm very happy to turn it back to uh, uh, Dean Pikovics for her comments. Thank you, YY and Sten. Those are a um, great way to kick off. I'm going to uh, add a few comments here and then we'll open it up for your questions. Uh, so please do type those into the box on Facebook or in the uh, Q&A at the bottom. Um, I'd like to broaden the discourse a bit to include a focus on some of the human factors that have influenced the scale of the pandemic. Um, specifically um, some of the social, psychological, and behavioral determinants and consequences. First of all, we are inherently a social species. And of course, infectious disease is driven by human interconnectedness. People together in schools and workplaces, homes and houses of worship, public transit, public parks, public protests, and so forth. 
These months of isolation and loss have forced us to recognize this all the more. And waves of the COVID pandemic include not just rising prevalence of respiratory illness, but also highlight other human frailties, including mental illness and substance use. One tragic uh, uh, consequence of COVID have been rising suicide rates among children, adolescents, and adults that have been documented in Japan, Korea, the United States, and others, other countries. I'm worried about our children. I'm worried about chronic school closures and homeschooling in many nations that affect learning, school performance, and cognitive development, especially among those already marginalized. I'm also concerned about the social and emotional development of infants and our youngest children. For example, it's critically important to wear masks, but what is the impact of masks on uh, infant and children's ability to read social cues or emotions? Second, as much as we like to think of ourselves as rational beings, uh, as a psychologist, I can tell you we are not. Judgment and decision-making are more often driven by emotions than logic. And I wonder, Stan, if your comments about uh, poor, le you know, about leadership planning and capacity is tied in part to this, uh, this drive by emotions uh, instead of logic. I think this also contributes to the resistance we see in many countries to social distancing, mask wearing, and adherence to lockdown orders. Though as YY mentioned, we do see this less here in Asia than in other parts of the world. And while we continue to relentlessly push scientific advances in vaccines and therapeutics, we still have to rely on the simplest of behavioral acts like hand washing, social distancing, mask wearing, and other preventive measures. With time and consequent fatigue, continued vigilance is critical and even more difficult. While there are many, many other things to highlight as we consider the COVID pandemic, my third point is simply a truism. Infectious diseases have no borders. A weak link anywhere leads to vulnerability everywhere. We have a moral imperative and a public health one to assure that multinational and multi-sectoral collaborations are prioritized. And again, I think these are things that YY and Sten have both touched on. Um, in addition to the profound health challenges, of course, every nation in the world is struggling with huge economic and social losses in all sectors and industries. And we must work together to prevent, detect, and rapidly respond to public health emergencies, address health inequalities, and recognize that political will is essential to take action to save lives and to build a safer and more secure world. And before I open for questions, I want to uh, uh, begin uh, to broaden our conversation uh, while still focusing on COVID. I wanna mention that while this pandemic rages on, there are other priority areas in health and public health that require our ongoing attention. It's been estimated that as many as one third of scientists pivoted to, um, uh, to a focus on research in COVID in the past year. And this has been absolutely essential and has led to the kinds of successes in terms of breakthrough discoveries and virology and vaccine development. Another thing that really um, highlights how essential this has been is two days ago in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, there was estimates of a pronounced decline in life expectancy in the United States due to COVID uh, in 2020. In one year, an impact on life expectancy and, um, and a rollback in the successes we've seen in reducing health disparities and mortality. At the same time, it's important to recognize that obesity, tobacco, and hypertension remain leading causes of death globally. And before you dismiss these as not being as important at this moment in time, I want to remind you that it's these very chronic illnesses that place individuals and communities at greater risk for COVID, both 
um, infection, as well as severity of disease and higher risks of death. Other infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, malaria, dengue, and HIV must also still be addressed and prevented. Uh, and, and just a final example, climate change. We could have a whole session on climate change, on the intersection of climate change and COVID. Um, in short, decreasing biodiversity and the pressure on ecosystems increase the risk for interface with animal and insect vectors. And climate change itself is a public health emergency, leading to increased infectious, respiratory and cardiovascular diseases threats to mental health, air pollution, flooding, forced migration, food insecurity and malnutrition, and premature deaths related to extreme weather events. So there's a lot going on, of course, all in this moment of, of a raging pandemic, uh, but I do want to make sure as we talk about reimagining public health, we'll focus, we'll try to find a little bit of balance. I'm sure we'll focus a bit more on COVID this evening or morning. But, uh, but also I wanna open it up to other questions as well. So while I take a moment to look at the questions that you have posted, I'll begin with a first question for Deans uh, Tio and Vermont. Um, gentlemen, uh, uh, change of course is not unique, but the pace of change has accelerated greatly in terms of knowledge generation and technology. What have been, what do you think have been the potential lasting impacts on scientific discovery? And uh, can you speculate on what changes may be more durable? And either one of you can, can begin, please. Well, why don't I start? Um, so it is indeed true that the world seems to be able to generate knowledge quicker and more specific, with greater specificity. So in theory, we are much better placed to handle many crises. And Jeanette, you talk about climate change, antimicrobial resistance, just like we, the world is also wondering about disease X, a future pandemic that is highly transmissible and highly virulent as well. But I think what we have seen so far with covid not just in one country, but globally. It's actually not the knowledge, but it's how we make use of this knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I'll, I'll raise this point about how there have been calls that about the World Health Organization not having done its duties well enough to raise the alarm. And therefore, people have been calling for a new organization, a new outfit that can have an early surveillance system to raise the alarm quickly and early on. But I always like to counter by saying that I don't think that's the answer. Because if we look at what happened in real life, that Italy, South Korea, China had a very large community outbreak in the early months of January and February 2020. And we just have to sit back and ask ourselves, what the European countries, North American countries, and many other parts of the world use that information for. Many of them practically did nothing. The governments or the people, they didn't use that opportunity that one or two months time to prepare for it. So I think that it is true that with change, we are better at generating knowledge. But I, I like to say that in public health, it is never just about the knowledge, it's how we implement the knowledge, how we monitor the effectiveness of what we do on the ground and also to evaluate them properly. The next is really around how, how do we shape human behavior? And I think this is where I will again draw reference to the Spanish flu in 1918. And I'm, I'm, I've been, people have been saying that I, I like to talk about how the people back in 1918 are not any more foolish or foolhardy than we are right now in 2021 and yet they saw between 50 to 100 million deaths, not infection, but deaths. So right now we are at more than 100 million infected, 104 million right now, and about equally 2 million deaths. I, I think that we need to think about some of the lessons that we have seen in the past 
that we haven't really yet learned about human behavior, about what you talk about, Jeanette, emotions, behavior, and, and how we logically think about the risk of different factors. In public health, vaccine hesitancy has always been a big problem. And right now with COVID-19 vaccines that are, that are coming up for nationwide rollouts and distribution, we now see another problem. It is not the availability of a vaccine, but it is people hesitant or resisting taking up the vaccine because they logically, they, they like to tell themselves that the risk of taking the vaccine is very high and there's a lot of uncertainty. So I think trying to handle human behavior is likely to be a very important aspect that we realize we need to, to learn from this crisis that will help us manage our ability to respond to future crisis. But I'll stop here for the time being. So over to you, Stan. Well, why, why you've done a terrific job uh, articulating um, uh, key points. Um, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, the global technological capacity response is terribly impressive. Um, when the Chinese actually sequenced the virus by early January, when a month before, we didn't even realize this virus was in humans, uh, I was terribly impressed. Um, and uh, when vaccine development was successful in a matter of months, uh, when the, the fastest vaccine ever developed was the monks, mumps, mumps vaccine, took them four years. And here it took about four months to develop uh, vaccines that turned out to be highly efficacious in clinical trials. So there's no question that on the technological side, this goes for testing, uh, test kits have been improved and developed. We haven't done quite as well with drugs, by the way, but uh, at least we have some monoclonal antibodies that are novel and effective. So the technological side has gone well. And as you correctly pointed out, YY, it's the human side that we haven't done so well with. The policy side, uh, as uh, you can see from places like Brazil and the US, the policy side has been a disaster. Um, and human uh, failings, the uh, failure to have planned logistics and supply chain and distribution, good old fashioned um, skills that, for example, many businesses have. Uh, there's a there's a project last mile that uh, colleagues of mine at the Yale School of Public Health are uh, deeply engaged with. And this is with a uh, software, I, I'm, I meant to say soft drink, soft drink company that is helping African uh, ministries of health with vaccine and drug distribution into rural clinics because you can go to the most remote rural part of Africa and you can uh, buy a cold soft drink or a cold beer, but sometimes the uh, clinic next door uh, doesn't have vaccines and, uh, and uh, drugs. Um, so we're trying to get the private sector to teach the public sector how to overcome logistics challenges in say the rainy season. And this sort of uh, mentality of having the public sector prepared for pandemic uh, crises, for emergencies. You know, with global climate change, we're going to be facing um, uh, climate-related health emergencies. Are we prepared for those? Um, are we prepared for uh, different flood drought cycles? Are we prepared for low-lying nations, including Singapore, being threatened by, uh, by rising ocean levels such that, such that storms are much worse because of the, um, of the sweep of the uh, sea into those island nations? Are we prepared for the wildfires of Siberia or California? The answer is no, we're not. So um, this pandemic might be a wake up call for uh, global societies and governments to take the uh, emerging public health threats far more seriously. So there, there's so much here that you both have said. I'll, I'll, um, I'm gonna just 
follow up on one thing on the public-private partnerships that I think um, is a durable, uh, you know, my question about durability, and I hope that this is part of a durable solution. You know, Sten, the, uh, you know, you talk about the last mile, um, and of course, com companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Starbucks, you know, have all volunteered their logistics, IT, supply chain expertise, operations, opening up their warehouses for vaccine centers and so forth. I, I was struck in preparing for this evening to see, uh, you were talking about soft drinks, uh, cold drinks. Let me talk about a warm drink and just mention, uh, you know, Starbucks serves a hundred million customers per week. And of course, you know, when uh, President Biden took office, they said, you know, we want to vaccinate a hundred million more Americans in a hundred days. So it's really interesting to imagine, um, you know, I don't know, you know, getting a vaccine with your morning latte, for instance. And of course, it's not that easy. Uh, but but I think that this is and must push us to do more and to do better. Um, so again, much more to say, but let me turn to a couple of questions from our audience and we'll try to do a little bit of rapid fire so we can get a bunch of these in. Um, why, why, when you began talking, you mentioned the World Health Organization and uh, uh, there was a question about how the World Health Organization, uh, you know, in a sense, the utility of the World Health Organization, is it working well? Do we need another? Um, and or, you know, I might say, how can we improve? And, and I, I'm hearkening back to something you said earlier in the evening, which is maybe it's a lot about communications and leadership. But can you just speak briefly on WHO and, and Sten, you might, uh, you might have something to say on this as well. So I'm actually one of those that believe that WHO has performed exceedingly well, exceptionally well during this crisis. And they have emerged as that, that one voice that the world needs in terms of how we handle a public health crisis like this. I know there have been a lot of criticism. We can talk about some of the criticisms. I, I do think that the criticisms, many of it, it's more political than factual. And at this point in time, COVAX facility is likely to be one of the most essential organization that is going to help the world distribute vaccines in a much more equitable sense. And without WHO, without its ability to command and to convene partners like Gavi, like the Gates Foundation, it's not going to be possible at this global stage. So I do think that criticisms at WHO, very unfair, they have done well in this crisis. And I think, you know, you mentioned equity. You know, again, we are not going to stem this epidemic with, uh, you know, if we are, it's a pandemic, we are not going to have an impact if there is hoarding and, you know, a restriction in, uh, in distribution from developed to developing nations. And this leads to another question. And Stan, I'll turn this to you. It's a, it's a good segue. Um, a question from an audience member saying, wealthy countries are purchasing millions of doses of vaccines for their citizens. Uh, is it their responsibility or what is the best way for developed countries to assist developing countries to inoculate uh, citizens? And should countries like the US, I might add Singapore as well, or the UK, engage in quote, vaccine diplomacy? What are your thoughts on that? Perhaps one of the most promising areas of diplomacy is uh, in the health arena. Just take a look at global smallpox eradication, how in the middle of the Cold War, the former USSR and the USA collaborated um, uh, actively and successfully with Europe and the, and the um, uh, low and middle income nations of the world that were largely afflicted by smallpox. And they wiped out smallpox from the face of the planet uh, using a highly effective vaccine strategy. We're poised uh, on, uh, on the edge of polio uh, eradication with just two countries still endemic for polio, uh, both of which conflict-ridden countries, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
um, and um, and a uh, 99.99% decline in polio again through global cooperation. So our uh, I would say the U.S. did something right when it started the PEPFAR program, the U.S. president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, in which this is the largest. Uh, public health investment, global public health investment in the history of humankind with over $80 billion invested by the U.S. alone in, um, in stemming the tide of, uh, of HIV mortality, mostly in Africa, but also in other countries. And so this has brought tremendous goodwill. Um, George w., former President George W. Bush is more popular in Africa than he is in the United States because Africans point to his initiative, which by the way was bipartisan with very strong support from both parties uh, as something that uh, truly made a difference in the history of that continent, of the continent of Africa. So at the end of the day, when we do global partnerships in health, it's a win-win. It's a win for the donor nation a win for the recipient nation. It helps stitch the world together and helps uh, confront health equity in a highly productive way. Now, we have not seen this yet in uh, the COVID pandemic. There is the COVAX initiative that WHO uh, helped spearhead and that Gavi is deeply involved with as well, um, in which uh, donor nations are in a position to donate vaccine, buy and donate vaccine to developing countries. But so far, the donor nations have been selfish and keeping the vaccine largely for themselves. What I'm, what I'm hoping is that when North America and Europe uh, and some of the more prosperous countries in um, Asia and Latin America, when they are able to um, vaccinate uh, at a maximum level, we will still have this huge capacity that industry is ramping up. Uh, and that will be uh, a tremendous opportunity to, to go into vaccine diplomacy and start to um, support global vaccination. Keep in mind that if we permit coronavirus to circulate extensively around the world, you will continue to develop uh, escape mutants. That's the nature of RNA viruses. They um, easily uh, mutate and you end up with escape mutants, which is why we have to have uh, influenza vaccines modified each and every year, why HIV uh, has so many strains. So at the, uh, because they're RNA viruses and they're very easily mutated when they replicate. So for, for us to protect Singapore and the United States, we have to stop transmission in um, Nigeria and Brazil. So we need a global perspective. And uh, it would be better, I think, if we had that health equity sensitivity immediately, but it's gonna be hard to convince the politicians when their own people are not uh, uh, protected to divert vaccine to for countries. Even if it's the right thing to do, that would be a tough political ask. Yeah, and you know, back to something I said earlier, uh, you know, vulnerability anywhere is vulnerability everywhere. And I think the point of uh, uh, the issues related to um, getting, you know, this rapid deployment of vaccines, and not just the operational issues, but as we've all talked about, um, breaking through vaccine hesitancy is so critical because um, we've got to get, you know, we're, 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 well, we're not getting ahead, but we've got to continue to get ahead because of course, if uh, there is not transmission, then there is not transmission of new variants uh, as we know. Now, there are a lot of questions about a vaccine. Let me throw another one in uh, to the mix here and it's tied to vaccines and trust. And then I'm gonna also see the question about trust and government. So two questions from our audience. One is how can vaccine uptake be increased in countries that have plentiful access? So even if we set aside the issues of inequality for a moment or distribution to developing countries, 
how can uh, vaccine uptake be increased in countries that have access, but a massive distrust in science? And then um, how is the public trust in government, uh, or one thing people point to is public trust in government as a crucial factor in controlling the pandemic? So we're seeing questions about trust or distrust in government, trust or distrust in science, um, and uh, wondering if either one of you want to uh, address that, the, those issues. So perhaps I can start on the trust issue. And in fact, I was reading the questions as well. It was rather specific to Singapore's general election as well. Um, I will address that very quickly later on. But I do say that there has been a trust barometer that was measured every year. And countries like China, Singapore, uh, jurisdiction including Hong Kong, Taiwan, the trust in the government in these locations actually are the high ones. And if we now reflect back and co co compare it with the performance in the ability to handle the crisis, we do see that there is a remarkable association. Uh, there's a correlation, but I, I would just leave it as that. We are all scientists here. But I do see that trust matters because there have been a lot of very difficult decisions that have been made. Asking people to wear a mask every time they step out of a house, making restaurants close during a lockdown, or even when they open up, limiting the number of customers or patrons that, cust that can be seated together. All of these are difficult decisions that you need the public, the community to buy into. And that is where the trust comes in. And this is why I mentioned that, that the ability for a country to have that level of trust, the, that level of trust must be built up during peacetime. Because during a crisis time, that's where trust will get used up. It's like a bag of brownie points because you are making very difficult decisions that you compel your people to follow with the threat of fines, of jail terms, of deportations. But all of that has to be grounded in some degree of trust. So I do see that trust is absolutely important. And just a very quick answer to the Singapore question, 61.2% was what the ruling party gained in last year's election. I actually think that in many, many countries in the world, 61% is a remarkable performance because in many countries, you are looking at very razor thin margins for the ruling party. So 61% is still an indication that there is a lot of trust in the government to handle crisis. And I will just leave it as that, but uh, Stan, over to you to add on, or Jeanette, over back to you. I, I'm well, not smiling in a, in a sad way because of course, you know, the absolute opposite has been true in the United States. And uh, Stan, maybe just a quick comment there and then we'll, we'll move on because there are quite a lot of questions. We'll try to get a few more in. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so this will be very quick. Um, the issue of vaccine hesitancy uh, was addressed by the Kaiser Family Foundation with a four point uh, question. If coronavirus vaccine is determined to be safe by scientists is available for free to everyone who wanted it, would you definitely get it? Probably to get it, probably not get it or definitely not get it. And you can see that there are still a lot of people in the United States who um, will probably or definitely not want the vaccine, 29%. Uh, and since many mathematical modelers think that herd immunity can be achieved if we can get to about 80% coverage, this is bad news. It is improving a bit, uh, but not as fast as we would like. And there is a political split in our country that for, uh, because, because the previous uh, president politicized a public health issue. Some of his followers are skeptical about vaccines, uh, and um, and uh, persons of color, particularly African Americans, are a little more skeptical. And if you don't have someone with a serious health condition in your household, you're also more likely to be skeptical. And there uh, there is this uh, difference that uh, Dean Teo uh, Teo said uh, early on that the communitarian philosophy of uh, many Asian countries contrast to the individualistic philosophy of the United States. 
So individuals who resent authority are twice as likely not to wear a mask. People who believe that the truth about coronavirus is being kept from the public are twice as likely not to uh, 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 wear a mask. And I, I wonder if you would just take note of these two websites um, that one is with NIH and one is with CDC. And these are some very helpful guides to try to confront vaccine hesitancy that have been developed very, very recently. Um, you know, there were a couple of questions about resistant and conspiratorial views. And if you just argue with people who say that this is conspiracy, uh, the Chinese government or the American government developed the, the vaccine and it escaped from a lab or whatever, um, you, you can say things like, well, you're right, the pharma pharmaceutical industry is making a lot of money on this. You're right that the vaccine was developed very, very quickly. You're right that the government has historically treated African-Americans badly. You, you've thought about this a lot. You value your freedom. You're going to have to try to say something positive to a vaccine-hesitant person before you try to educate them. And uh, we think that it's an important message to say to a vaccine-hesitant person, you may not want the vaccine, but here's a good idea to take the vaccine to protect your family to protect your clan, to protect your community. You be a protector for your loved ones and the people uh, who are close to you. That's the best reason for you to get a vaccine. So you're not, you're not saying, well, get a vaccine to protect yourself. If the person says, I don't take vaccines, I never can get a flu vaccine. I don't want a vaccine. I don't believe the vaccine is necessary. If, if you just counter, counter argue, uh, it will probably be counterproductive. And people with conspiratorial views uh, will likely not convert their viewpoints. People of color in the United States, persons of minority, ethnic, and racial background, they tend not to want to be the guinea pigs. They don't want to be first in line because their communities have been uh, mistreated in the past. And there, I think, working with the pastors, educating in the hair salons and the barber shops getting into the community can make a huge difference. I'm much more optimistic that we can turn the points of view of uh, our uh, minority communities. Uh, the conspiratorial uh, philosophy folks, that's gonna be tougher. Okay, we just have about five more minutes to the top of the hour. I'm gonna ask two pretty big questions, but I'm gonna ask you each to respond uh, as quickly as you can. Thanks though, Stan, for also for sharing those data. Um, the first is, what have you learned most about yourself as a leader in the past year? How have you responded and how do you think that uh, our, our discipline has responded in many ways? Quick response from me. Clearly, I've learned that 24 hours, it's actually possible to work all 24 hours. Oh. In a, uh, but I think I'm very pleased to see the public health community stepping up with the right kind of information, data, guidance, evidence, whether it is to the policymakers or to the media to guide the, the community. That is some, a, a very practical sense that we use our knowledge and our, our ability to digest information to really help improve the situation. Over back to you, Jeanette. Stan? I'm, I'm going to say something very similar. I think that at our School of Public Health at Yale, we were so very pleased to be able to jump into this uh, with both feet and immerse ourselves in these issues because we had a lot to contribute, whether it was on the policy side, uh, the forecasting and modeling side, the public health response, contact tracing, um, uh, education, um, uh, risk reduction and mitigation, uh, product development. At every imaginable level, um, we have been able to engage communities and make a difference. And um, my, the president of my university uh, has an alumni event coming up and he wanted some notes about what has the School of Public Health done vis-a-vis -vis the coronavirus pandemic. And um, in just very brief words, I filled two pages in, in record time and sent it to colleagues and they filled two more pages uh, you know, to, to write this out would take 100 pages because uh, it's, been, it's been a tremendous opportunity for those of us trained in public health to make concrete contributions uh, to battling the pandemic. 
Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I think for me, one of the things that I have, um, I found myself, particularly in the early days, uh, being here in a liberal arts college uh, and yet having a background in public health uh, as a, a hopefully a trusted and reliable source of information, the importance of transparency, the importance of communication and the importance of, 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 of calm and sort of a steady hand on the rudder. And I think all of these things have been really important to, uh, to think about um, uh, sort of stable and uh, forward looking uh, you know, momentum, being able to continue to run the college, our universities, our research labs and, uh, and um, clinical spaces. There, the other thing, and this ties this into a couple of questions that emerged as well, where I think that as public health leaders, we have been more stronger vocal advocates to political leaders. This was posted as a question, but I'll, I'll turn it to a statement. Uh, and, and there has been an openness, in some cases re resistance, but then now more openness to recognizing something YY that you said early on, and that is the absolute uh, critical nature of being evidence-based. You know, no question that we, you know, must lead with the science, uh, leading with facts, discovery, and solutions. And I think that this is how we've all been trained, and it's been, um, you know, uh, a demand, but also in many ways a privilege and a responsibility to carry forward with this and to have sort of broad, uh, broad understanding of how important, how important this is. Um, we are now with about uh, two uh, minute left. So I'll just say quickly, you know, I'd wanted, we, we call this reimagining for post COVID world. I mentioned a number of things in the beginning that I think beyond COVID that we do need to be thinking about in the next years and decades ahead. Again, very, very quickly, maybe just one or two. Uh, Stan, we'll start with you. What are, what are other things that you need to continue to have our attention? The threat of global pandemic influenza is with us at all times. And um, we all are aware of the so-called Spanish influenza of 1918, 1919. That's estimated to have killed 50 million people worldwide, worse than coronavirus, uh, which has killed about two and a half million people. Um, and we've had pandemic influenza in 1957, in 1968, in 2009, and it's continuous potential threat. So um, ongoing vigilance and preparedness for global respiratory pandemic threats is essential. And I'm just hoping that we can learn from the novel coronavirus to be ready. We of course have a, a global climate change, so we can expect mosquitoes, ticks to live longer, to have uh, uh, wider, wider um, uh, ecological niches. So this could exacerbate uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, also waterborne diseases, cholera and many others could be exacerbated by changing um, drought and flood conditions in the great river basins of the world. For example, the Himalayan river basins, the Mekong, the uh, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Indus valleys are, are, are in trouble, to be honest. So there are many, many issues where we're going to have to be vigilant and uh, uh, aggressive in our planning and our preparedness for response. Thanks, Dan. Uh, why, why? Quick answer. I think just to reiterate the point that both Stan and Jeanette you have brought up, the importance of relying on evidence and that really comes about with the right kind of academic government partnership and while we have the opportunity it's time to build that kind of partnership because many schools of public health at the present still do not work with their regional jurisdiction or national jurisdiction to really contribute to policy and program evaluation i think it's time to change that over back to you Jeanette. okay well let me close and you know, say our advances today and over this last year will absolutely impact our ability to respond to the next pandemic threats and hopefully prevent it, as well as the many other challenges uh, we've just barely scratched the surface on today. Uh, 
if I was in a, in a public hall, I'd say, please join me in thanking uh, Deans uh, YYTO and Sten Vermund for sharing your brilliant insights uh, and expertise to my colleagues at Yale and US for your excellent operational support and to all of you around the world for joining us. I'll close with the words of the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus. Let's fight, unite, and ignite. Best to all of you. Thank you and good night or good morning.